Hello and welcome to this webinar on the subject of climate change, sustainability and competition law, a topic that's attracting much interest uh, at present. And rightly so, the targets for achieving a low carbon economy and environmental sustainability are much discussed, as are the questions of whether a competition law focus which promotes low prices and therefore encourages high consumption or production and packaging methods which do not always pay sufficient heed to the damage that they may cause to the environment, whether or not those tools can be modified by applying um, current tools in a particular way, developing new ones. I'm delighted today to introduce to you Simon Holmes, who's going to speak first. Simon is a distinguished academic and, amongst other things, a visiting professor at Oxford University, having been a competition law practitioner in private practice for many years. He has written and spoken extensively on the topic of today's webinar, and we're very pleased to have his experience and expertise available to us today. Last year, he published a book which he co-wrote with Dirk Middelschuter and Martin Snoop of the Dutch Competition uh, Authority, the latter, entitled Competition Law, Climate Change and Environmental Sustainability. And I'm sure that at least some of you will also know him as a judge at the Competition Appeal Tribunal. Simon is speaking, I think, primarily on EU competition law enforcement. I should say slides will be available after the webinar uh, on a web page, along with the YouTube recording of today's uh, uh, webinar. After Simon's talk, I plan to speak primarily about the situation in national law, also about where some other national competition authorities have got to so far uh, in facing the challenges of applying competition law in a way that encourages sustainable practices, uh, together with one or two other thoughts and themes. And I hope that there will be some time for questions before the hour is up. And I would encourage you to use the uh, chat function to send any questions that you have. So at this point, uh, I'd like to hand over to Simon. Thank you very much, Sarah. And as Sarah said, I was a private practitioner for many, many years. And, but towards the end of that period as a practitioner, I became increasingly concerned about the potential tension between my work as a competition lawyer, the process of competition, and increasing concerns over climate change. Competition can contribute to economic growth, improving, improving productivity, et cetera, and so forth. But it also drives consumption, pushing us to consume more and more of the Earth's resources. And yes, competition drives innovation, sustainable innovation indeed, but it also can be a race to the bottom with firms forced, even against their will, to cut costs, sometimes regardless of the consequences for the planet. So I spent the last year or two thinking about how we can take account of sustainability in a modern competition policy. Paul, if you could keep moving the slides, um, that'd be great. Thank you. When I first started looking at this, it was a very fringe issue. But I think it's fair to say it's one of the two hottest topic, hottest issues in competition law today, the other being the platforms issues. And I've come to the conclusion that there's a real chance that competition law, even if it can't positively help with uh, fighting climate change, although I'm not ruling that out, at least uh, it need not stand in the way of effective action to fight climate change. Sarah will be speaking about some of the national authorities, but I just say briefly, that I think the Dutch are the market leaders here, but there are others pushing this agenda, the Greeks, the Irish, the Belgians, others come to mind. But industry is also getting more involved with this. I had the privilege of chairing an ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, working party on this, and they published a paper. Major corporations like Unilever have made substantial contributions to the debate. International bodies have got interested, rather some of them late to the table, but better late than never, the ICN, the ECN, and particularly the OECD, which has had a couple of round tables on this topic. And one of the um, papers that I will point you to is a, a paper I wrote for the OECD uh, round table uh, last year, or the year before last actually now. Important in all this, of course, is the European Commission, who's carried out a couple of consultations, one on its horizontal guidelines, one on its uh, Green Deal and the relationship with competition policy. And its latest iteration of that is a policy brief published in September. We expect some further something further from the Commission um, in February. But don't underestimate the extent of opposition to uh, to, to start at times, particularly the conservative competition law establishment or the competition establishment, because it's not just the lawyers, also very much the economists. 
Moving on, I would suggest that, the, I, in my view, sustainability is potentially relevant to all areas of competition law. The one we're primarily concerned with today is cooperation, that is, um, the relationship between sustainability and the prohibition on anti-competitive agreements, Article 101 and the national equivalents. But it's also relevant to Article 102, abuse of dominance and the national equivalents, whether Article, whether um, we're looking at Article 102 as a sword to fight unsustain, unsustainable practices or potentially at sustainability as a shield against wrongful allegations of abuse. And it's also um, potentially relevant to mergers, either as a positive factor when looking to clear a deal or a negative factor when looking at the possibility of blocking or requiring remedies in exceptional cases, of course. All three of those topics are certain things I've been writing and speaking on. And the paper I wrote for the Journal of Antitrust Enforcement is the main paper on that. And I would uh, mention that in the slides which you will have in Appendix, in Annex A, there is a list of some of the publications which I will refer to. But those are the areas I've been primarily interested in, but it's also relevant to two others, state aid, the transition to a sustainable economy is going to require masses of public support, and that require much of that will constitute state aid in EU terms or subsidies in UK or global terms. And at its simplest, we need to stop providing state aid to fossil fuels, and we need to support renewables and a just transition. But I also mentioned public procurement, something people always don't necessarily think of when they're talking about competition law, but it is really an aspect of competition law in the wider sense. It's about a level playing field. And in my view, if we if the rules were more friendly to this agenda, the potential for the public procurement to drive the transition to a sustainable uh, basis is, um, I think, uh, enormous. And the book, which Sarah kindly mentioned, has some excellent chapters on those two topics, which I don't personally claim to be an expert on. Moving on, I think this is no, it's not an exaggeration to say, um, Paul, next, next slide, please. It's not an exaggeration to say that we have an existential crisis. I don't, I, I, that term shouldn't be used lightly, but I think that is the case in relation to climate change. And as Commissioner Vestaya says, this requires everyone is called upon to make our contribution to the necessary change, including competition enforcers. And I would add the business community and the antitrust competition law community. Regulation is often the answer. Of course it is, but it's not often. It is not enough. It's too slow. It's limited in scope. And frankly, in my view, it's simply not ambitious enough. Look at the outcomes and lack of them at COP26. And of course, business can sometimes compete on the sustainability of their products. My products are more sustainable than yours. Buy mine. But in many cases in the real world, that is not as easy as you might think. Businesses will often suffer a first mover advantage, disadvantage. Sometimes, not always I would emphasize, the more sustainable way of production is more expensive, perhaps only in the short term. So the first mover suffers a competitive disadvantage. And even if they can um, produce some products sustainably, it may be on a small scale. And we can't wait for something to be produced on a sustainable basis as, and remain a niche part of the market when we need to transfer to transform our whole economy, whole sectors of our economy onto a sustainable footing. And that requires, in many instances, cooperation between businesses. But that's where competition law comes in. Fear of competition law pro prohibiting cooperation with competitors. A survey by Linklate has suggested that some 60% of businesses said they'd shied away from cooperating with competitors for fear of the competition law. In my own career, I've come across many instances of that. Some of those are set out in Annex B to the slides. I'll give you just a few examples. I worked with the UK's resource um, RAP, the Resor Waste Resource and Action Programme, trying to increase the UK's rate of recycling. For example, we worked with um, suppliers and retailers to reduce the use of plastic, to increase the use of recycling. That required working with suppliers work and retailers together. And yes, we made progress, but we could have made better progress, I think, if there hadn't been an, that such nervousness about competition law. More acute examples, working with Client Earth, they were working for the Sustainable Fish Alliance, trying to stop unsustainable fishing in the North Atlantic, with some stocks being completely depleted, absent urgent action. 
But when you agree not to fish on an unsource on an unsustainable basis, somebody will say, ah, but isn't that a collective boycott? Well, you can see where they're coming from, but it is not the correct analysis and it's not the sort of thing which um, competition authorities are going to concern them with. That's been confirmed to be many instances, on many occasions, on a private basis. But it covers all sorts of diverse sectors. Those examples cover efforts to um, make the supply chains in the fashion industry more sustainable, to source soybean and palm oil on a more sustainable basis, attempts to reduce deforestation of the Amazon. All these instances are real life examples of where the companies want to do something but are nervous about competition law. But I'd emphasize here, I am not, we're not talking about any sort of greenwashing. If companies agree not to compete on environmental criteria, that's to my mind a straightforward cartel. The Ad Blue case, which the Commission's looking at, is an example of that. Um, putting it in very simple terms, before the war, I understand there was an agreement between light bulb manufacturers not to produce longer life light bulbs so they could sell more. Clear cartel. If, on the other hand, light bulb manufacturers were agreed to phase out um, short life light bulbs, I guess the OFT suggest, suggested in a submission to the OECD that that might not be caught by competition law at all. And yes, of course, there is a risk of spillover from a, a laudable, lawful cooperation on sustainability and the risk that it moves into unlawful activities. But that's no different to a trade association or having a drink in a pub with a competitor. You have to set ground rules. Most instances where people talk about greenwashing, it, there are consumer law issues, people making unfounded claims. That's a very real issue, but it's not a competition law issue. So moving on, in my view, um, we do have the legal tools to take account of sustainability. In my early works, I focus particularly on the EU's constitutional provisions, but there are similar provisions in the national, le national legislation, and above all, in the competition law provisions themselves, Article 101, 102, and their national equivalents. So moving to the constitutional provisions, I'm not giving a lecture on constitutional law. Incidentally, when I say constitutional provisions, I mean the important bits at the beginning of the treaty that basically say what the treaties are all about. I've set out one or two in my slide, in this slide and Paul, the next slide. But the key point is that the constitutional provisions embed sustainability into the goals of EU uh, competition law. I'll just mention one of them, which is on the slide there, Article 11, just to give a flavour. Environmental protections must be integrated into the definition and interpretation of the union policies and activities, and in particular, with a view to promoting sustainable development. Now, where does it say ah, except for when applying uh, competition policy? Well, nowhere, of course. So what I want to do moving on is to focus on the law and not on abstract concepts like consumer welfare, public interest, non-economic factors, non-competition factors, all these sort of things that get discussed at endless conferences. They may or may not be useful terms, but they cannot be the right starting point for any analysis, which has to be what the law actually says. Just as a aside, consumer welfare, it's not in the treaty, and it's not ever, and it's never been endorsed by the Court of Justice. But actually, if it was in the treaty, it could be just fine. If you look up what consumer welfare is, it's health, happiness, the future of a person or group. Synonyms are well-being and good health. To my mind, that's at least as capable of encompassing concepts like ideas like having clean air to breathe, producing goods using fewer resources, or having enough food to eat. At least it covers those at least as much as getting the next um, consumer good for one cent or one penny less. So let's moving on, moving on, let's move away from theoretical discussions of consumer welfare. These discussions reminded me of the story of the Emperor Nero of Rome fiddling whilst Rome burnt, and that led me to devise this little cartoon here. And um, my frustration has only grown over the years. I understand that this cartoon, incidentally, is up on the walls of um, the European uh, Commission in DG Comp somewhere, which uh, made me smile. So moving to the law. Key point for me is how can sustainability agreements, agreements among competitors to fight climate change 
or make their the production in an industry or market more sustainable, escape the prohibition of Article 101 of Chapter 1 prohibition or whatever. This, this diagram in my papers suggests five ways. Now, these aren't formal legal ways, but they're just convenient ways of looking at it. And I don't intend to discuss um, those today. The one I want to say a little bit about is the what I call the exemption route, the exemption for an agreement. Um, just mentioning the others as we move on, Article 101, um, it's very clear that and we should always remember this as competition lawyers or competition economists. Most agreements don't restrict competition law at all. And not surprisingly, there are examples in the environmental area where the European Commission or others have said that. Um, there are particular channels. I'm not going to go into what I call the Albany route, which is on the next slide. But I, and then there are those who think that the best route out is the so-called ancillary restraints or objective necessity um, provision, which is on the next slide. It's not my favourite route, but for those who like this route or favour this doctrine, the idea is that sustainability agreements, which only contain proportionate restrictions without which the agreement wouldn't be concluded and which are necessary to carry out an environmental regulatory task, wouldn't be caught by the prohibition on anti-competitive agreements in the first place. Uh, as, I, as I say somewhat flippantly, if that's what it takes, if that's the route which finds favour with some uh, in a competition authority, so if something's not caught uh, at all, then fine. It is an option. But it's the fourth route, the exemption route, which I've been most focused on, which I discuss on the next uh, slide. This has been the subject of much academic debate, much of it quite empty in my view. Uh, it sounds bizarre, but I was at a conference not so long ago, pretty high powered one, with lots of uh, eminent lawyers and economists, and they were discussing uh, where an exemption might be justified. Not one of them mentioned what the law actually said. They go straight into these abstractions about non-economic factors or consumer welfare or whatever. But you really do need to look at what the law actually says as a starting point. And there are many um, eminent uh, papers on this subject now. Uh, I'd single out just one or two as papers by Maurits Dolmans or Jordan Ellison or the Dutch guidelines, which Sarah will mention, all of which address this. Um, admirably. Just to mention a couple of features of this exemption provision, the first and second conditions. As I suspect most people here are well aware, for an agreement to benefit from an exemption, it must meet each of four conditions. The first one is that the agreements must contribute to improving the production or distribution of goods or to promoting technical or economic progress. Now, people ask themselves the question, ah, oh, but can we take into account non-economic factors here? Well, I make two points there. First, to my mind, if you can produce something on a more sustainable basis, that is economic progress. But that actually is not the end of the question. Economic progress is only one of four limbs here. What about improving production? Agreements to use fewer resources. Improving distribution. Sharing distribution logistics. Promoting technical progress, developing new green technologies. There is plenty of scope for uh, sustainability uh, agreements to give the sort of benefits which um, Article 101.3 envisages. And moving on, the European Commission has recognised that. In its um, briefing paper in September, it recognised that a sustainability benefits qualitative efficiencies. They gave the example of replacing non-sustainable products with a more sustainable one, cost efficiencies, for example, reducing plastic packaging or condensing plastic bottles. That made me smile because it's something I advised on at least 15 years ago and said it didn't see it as problematic. And that's consumers appreciate more sustainable products. That's a more subtle point. The example here might be fair trade coffee. Fair trade coffee may not taste any better than coffee produced in an unfair way, but it's certainly a better product. And the Commission is recognising that now. So that's great. However, the difficult point moving on is the requirement, I'm sorry, I say it's the, the, the principle is quite right, for the second condition of Article uh, for an exemption is that consumers must get a fair share of the benefits I've just been referring to. And this is really the sticking point at the moment. It raises two key questions. Must 
the who which consumers are we talking about? Are we just talking about those in the relevant economic market in the techie way in which we economic a competition lawyers and economists envisage it? Or are we talking about consumers more widely? The treaty is silent on that point. And must the consumers, whoever they are, be fully compensated, as commission policy seems to be suggesting? Or must those consumers just get a fair share of the benefits as EU law, UK law, and national law of other countries actually state? Here, the commission, moving on in its policy brief, is, gives us um, some good and bad news. The good news is that they say the benefits achieved on separate markets can be taken into account. Now, that's a useful clarification. But the consumers affected must be substantially the same. And that's not in the law. It doesn't fit leading cases like C said. That's the washing machine case, which I can talk about if people wish. And it certainly is not adequate in the context of the climate crisis or the European Commission and national government's own Green Deal ambitions. Give me a couple of examples. If you have a large number of customers for as an as agreement between producers of a product that's widely used by a large number of customers, say to phase out the use of fossil fuels in production, there'll be a large number, and then let's suppose at short term that's more expensive, but there'll be a large number of consumers buying that product and therefore getting the benefits of um, the cleaner air uh, and um, and so forth. So that one will probably pass on the Commission's test. But to take an example given by Moritz Dolmans in a, blog, in a very good blog, supposing airlines were to agree to a work to try and use cleaner fuels rather than dirty aviation fuel. And let's suppose, which is probably realistic in this instance, that short term, that's more expensive. Unfortunately, that wouldn't seem to meet the Commission's test. Why? Because relatively few people would be that there would be a significant increase in costs, but relative, let's say, business price to go to New York goes up by a thousand pounds. But those consumers, those particular consumers, they're not going to get, however much you price carbon, they're not going to get sufficient benefit individually to compensate for that, or as a, or as a narrow group to compensate for that. Well, that's bonkers. It's only fair that they should bear the cost, because those are the consumers whose demand is driving the pollution. And that's exactly the sort of agreement that we'd like to see. So whilst one can understand in a very techie way where the commission's coming from, the outcome is ridiculous. So moving on, the other conditions, I'm not gonna talk about those so much, but they are very important. The agreement must be no more restrictive than necessary. Very important, for example, if, if the businesses can compete adequately and move to, to transform an industry on a, to a sustainable footing, then there's no justification for cooperation. Similarly, just because you agree to phase out certain inputs uh, which are unsustainable, it doesn't mean to say that you can that you can agree in any way to pass those costs on to consumers. It must be no more restrictive than necessary. And of course, there must be no elimination of competition. So I'd like to move on, uh, just jumping a couple of um, slides, um, Paul, to abuse of dominance. Which slide. I'll just say a couple of words about this. I've written about this in my paper in the Journal of Antitrust Enforcement, and I've got a new paper coming out with Michelle Meager on the control of monopoly power shortly. But just a couple of points. Article 102, I think, could be used more as a sword to fight unsustainable practices by dominant companies. It, what, it, what strikes me when I looked at this was, as a community, we've been obsessed with exploitative abuses. And we look at arcane things like fancy rebate systems that are considered to be an abuse. And I'm not quarreling with that um, legislation, with, some, with the, the, those cases. But it does strike me how little we have used um, the exploitative abuse part, the role. And that strikes me as for two reasons. First of all, three out of the four examples in Article 102 are of exploitative, not exclusionary abuses. And secondly, if you could talk to the man or woman in the street about the concept of abuse, it fits far better with it, the, the idea of an exploitative abuse. If you describe things being done by a dominant company um, of, in an unsustainable way to uh, an ordinary person outside the antitrust public, it's a, a, exploitative abuses which would come to their mind. The example I gave was unfair purchase prices, 
the payment of uh, obscenely low prices for certain inputs um, uh, to, say, farmers, which don't cover the costs of production and don't enable the suppliers to feed a family. And the other strand which I've mentioned is using sustainability as a shield. What by that, uh, what I mean is, supposing a, a major multinational is trying to move to a more sustainable basis, and they're looking not just at their own production, but they're looking at their inputs, and they're looking at what happens downstream. And they say, I'm not going to supply my product to somebody who's just going to, when they finish with it, dump it in a river. I want them to be recycling it. Um, or if I do supply it to somebody who's using it in a less sustainable way, I'm going to charge them more. That, in my view, should not be seen as discriminatory pricing or a refusal to supply. We should not be discouraging big companies from trying to do the right thing, particularly just as big companies have the potential to do the most harm, they also have tremendous potential to help us in this transformation. So moving on to a conclusion, in my view, we have the, the, both the legal basis and policy considerations all point to taking climate change and environmental sustainability into account in a modern competition policy. But there are those who say, I oh, purport to be sympathetic. Yes, Simon, I understand where you're coming from, but isn't it all too difficult, is the phrase that rings. But my answer to that is multiple, multi, multiple. But at its simplest, I would say, well, we must apply the law. Secondly, I think competition law should focus on what's important. If you just focus on what's easy, then it risks becoming irrelevant. And many feel that that was, that was what was happening with US antitrust law, at least until recently. And don't imagine that any sort of narrower price-centric short-term approach is easy. Anybody who sat in court, as I have, with 200 pages of econometrics saying this and 200 pages of econometrics saying the exact opposites, knows that the traditional narrow approach is not easy. And balancing different factors is exactly what competition authorities have traditionally done, and it's what courts are able to do. And I make this point only slightly in jest. There is a reason why judges are called judges, and that's because they're called upon to make judgments, to exercise judgment. It's not just a question of punching in some numbers, pressing some buttons, and waiting for an outcome. But, again, moving on, if Anybody thinks that I'm anti-economist, far from it. I say to my economist friends, no, there's plenty of work. Our approach to this is actually more economic. Taking into account externalities and trying to get to the true costs of production, getting at a true price that doesn't um, leave dump costs on society is extremely complex. And it makes use of the most um, uh, modern environmental quantitative techniques going. Again never forgetting that we still need to make value judgments. And finally, there are those who say, ah, but isn't this a slippery slope? What about other concerns that people have? What about the other things that are mentioned in the, uh, in the constitutional provisions of the treaties or whatever, whether it's gender issues, racial issues or whatever? My answer to that is twofold. First, if we're going to single out any one thing to really try and take it into account in competition policy, surely the climate emergency is the one to focus on. And secondly, I am not in any way dissing those other things. They should stand or fall on their own merits, but let's not any difficulties in analysing those undermine our attempts to fight climate change. So in conclusion, well, actually, I'll just mention that I, I've made a number of, and others have made a number of proposals for action, which is some of which are set out in the next uh, two slides. Um, but actually, most of those now are well in hand. I mentioned the European Commission's coming out, for example, with some new guideline, draft guidelines in the next uh, uh, month or two. Member states are working on those, and I think Sarah may say something about that. Um, the, and the, Europe, and the author competition authorities are increasingly saying, we are open to discuss these issues with you, bring your test cases to us. So I shall park my proposals for actions and move to my final slide, uh, Paul. Um, proposals for action, uh, beyond proposals for action. There's much that we can do without changing the law. I made a few suggestions for changing the law, but that's not the central point. We did, we've got the necessary tools and we need to revisit the law and economics. And I'd ask yourself, ask yourself this question. Are you happy with what competition law is doing? Yes, we may be, we may be condemning uh, cartels that are harming consumers. Yes, we may be approving mergers which are um, in his efficiency enhancing 
But if competition law is standing in the way of vital action to fight climate change, I for one don't think it's doing enough or we need to revisit it. We may still need some changes and there are genuine difficulties. I mentioned the genuine difficulties around the fair share of the benefits. Those are important technical issues that we need to, to work through. But to my mind, the biggest difficulty is still the conservative nature of the competition establishment. But I do think things are moving broadly in, our, in, our, in the right direction. And there's a vital role for us all to play within that competition community. And uh, I won't take you to them now, but uh, the final parts of my slides contain two things. Um, uh, Paul's put them up now. Uh, Annex A contains a list of some of the publications if anybody's interested in looking at this um, further. And there are eminent publications by uh, many other people, some of which I've um, mentioned earlier. And then the final annex there just sets out one or two examples of how in the real world, um, fear of competition law is inhibiting vital action to fight climate change. So with that, I will, um, I, I will stop and pass back to Sarah. Sarah, over to you. <clears throat> Simon, thank you very much for that. Um, OK, so my slides are going to um, follow on and deal a little with UK competition law and other tools. And if I could go to my first slide, please, Paul. Thank you. Uh, this slide sets out the fact that, as we all know, given the history of UK competition law, chapters one and chapter two uh, mirror the EU law pro provisions that Simon has already talked about. And the key point, I think, following on from uh, the discussion that he's given is that there are no substantive di differences in the wording of those provisions and the five routes that uh, he has already referred to apply equally under the UK legislation. It is true that the UK provisions don't form part of a treaty with, for example, Article 11 uh, of the TFEU on environmental principles, but nonetheless, the wording is, is still there and that absence seems unlikely to make any substantive difference because the same terms are used. And for example, in section nine of the Competition Act dealing with exemptions, it's hard to see why uh, the terms that Simon's referred to would be given any different meaning from those which the EU has espoused or may indeed espouse going forward. And I just wanted to point to one perhaps minor example, but the CMA's information sheet from January 2021, which you can see referenced in my fourth bullet there, um, refers in particular to the EU's horizontal guidelines in relation to standardisation agreements. And those guidelines make a number of references to sustainability, for example, as a particular example in relation to washing machines and phasing out unfriendly machines as a result of uh, manufacturers' agreements. All of those things refer to sustainability benefits. And it's clear, it seems to be, that uh, the CMA and no doubt UK competition lawyers and courts as a whole uh, would expect that sustainability comes in in the same way as it would do under EU law. Given the uh, EU, uh, sorry, the UK's international law commitments on climate action, it would also, it seems, uh, be surprising for the UK to take a different approach. And the CMA has begun since 2020 to refer to to refer as one of its strategic aims to supporting the transition to a low carbon economy uh, as one of its objectives. And it's therefore indicated that it's going to act in the future in a way to further that uh, objective. So again, I think that would point towards the view that it's unlikely to make it take a limited view of the potential of the provisions that it has. Uh, was also noted on this sheet in January 2021, the CMA issued uh, for the first time uh, an information sheet on environmentally, uh, environmentally sustainable sustainability agreements and competition law. That itself, as I've said, places some emphasis on standardisation agreements and also goes through the, the various routes, I think, that Simon has, has already made. It does not, I think, make any commitments on how far the exemption provisions are to be interpreted nor does it refer to any guidance notes, opinions, uh, etc., showing what would be permissible. Um, these are really decisions and opinions that have not yet been taken or published. And one of the points that I think um, was in Simon's action list and may be helpful in future uh, and may, may, may be in the course of uh, preparation is a list of examples, for example, in, like those in relation to the, uh, in the horizontal guidelines in relation to standardization. Thirdly, 
uh, they're not actually identifying any changes in the law as to how it will be interpreted or, or how um, the law will be enforced, rather that there's a number of possibilities and um, I think the inference is that they should be used as widely as possible. And lastly, of course, it doesn't deal with the questions of abuse, um, which is a broader question, again, Simon touched on, but offers possibilities. So, again, there's no guidance, decisions, et cetera, on what's permissible in that front. If I could move to the next slide, please. Uh, this sets out uh, the requirement placed on the courts, the CAT and the CMA, uh, requiring them to act with a view to ensuring consistency in application of principles in pre-Brexit case law and treaty provisions and decisions uh, to their cases. And as mentioned, uh, they also have to have regard to relevant decisions or statements of the Commission before 2020, unless withdrawn. Whilst there may be a decision as regards new decisions, if those are more favourable to supporting sustainability, then it seems uh, likely that the CMA will have to give careful consideration following suit to something, or, or, or perhaps adopting something no less innovative. Um, particularly given the CMA's uh, aim. So I think really Section 60A does suggest that there is likely to be a converging or conforming interpretation uh, moving forward. On to the next slide, please. And I was going to mention here what's happening in relation to other NCAs. And the one that attracts the most of the headlines is the ACM, the Dutch National Competition Authority, uh, which Simon has referred to. It has taken the lead, it seems, so far in trying to stimulate EU-wide EU changes. Uh, and as you'll see from this slide, it published uh, draft guidelines first in July 2020, and I believe it was the first NCA to do so. Last January, it updated and revised those draft guidelines, referring specifically to opportunities within competition law. So the aim that it has uh, is to make clear to companies where conduct as regards agreements touching on sustainability matters will not be caught by uh, enforcement action. The approach is to therefore grasp the difficult nettle of saying when wider benefits that those for society as a whole outweigh the disadvantages uh, of any restriction of competition. And so it seems that the desire is to have a re-evaluation re to some degree of those interests that are relevant and how some of them uh, will override the debit balance uh, of the restrictions on competition. If I could turn to the next slide, please, Paul. Other features to note are that the ACM has expressly said that it is intended that its uh, documents are to promote EU-wide discussion. Their approach is that they have said they won't impose post fines for collective agreements when the draft guidelines have been followed in good faith. And the last point here mentioned is that the, they, along with the Greek Competition Authority, commissioned a report from economists on identifying and valuing sustainability benefits, which was also published in January 2021. Pause there to say this, this may be key, as more recognised examples and tools for valuing benefits, which may not so far have been sufficient to outweigh this debit side emerge, uh, one hopes that that will provide greater certainty and place NCAs and parties uh, in a position where they're more at ease in using the uh, provisions to help promote sustainable agreements. If I can go to the next slide, please. Actually, before that, I want to though, we should just mention the Greek authority, the HCC, has collaborated with the H ACM, as described, and published staff discussion papers, papers for OECD discussion at the end of 2020. And in J July 2021, it launched a public consultation on its concept of a green sandbox, which is the idea that companies should have the freedom without competition law constraining uh, the unduly to experiment and to innovate in relation to products and services and related matters, business models and delivery methods. Links to the publicly available contributions to that consultation are given online and further work is continuing, uh, as I understand it, in relation to that. The purpose, again, is not to allow any form of green cartel, but to enable transformation to a friendlier environment for sustainable agreements such as that that exists for uh, research and development agreements. And, and also, I think they uh, hope for the establishment of an advice unit, in, including those from various regulatory bodies, sort of pan-Europe, pan but taking into account a number of different interests. 
the Austrians, I think, have adopted legislation in September 21, introducing an express exemption for agreements that substantially contribute to an ecologically sustainable or climate neutral, neutral economy. They've done this by stating expressly that consumers and consumers shall also be considered to be allowed a fair share of the resulting benefit if the improvement of the production or distribution of goods or the promotion of technical or economic progress contributes to an ecologically sustainable or climate neutral economy. So they've uh, tried to grapple this expressly with the technical question. I don't think that they have indicated a way of measuring this. Um, and I think I'll be corrected, but I think guidelines are uh, awaited. Um, but again, one can see a move on the part of national competition authorities uh, in this way. So looking at this slide uh, that I have there now, what of the UK's position? On the 29th of September of last year, the CMA issued a call for inputs um, and the deadline for those closed in November of last year. I understand that it uh, aimed to provide advice on the issue in the early part of this year. The reason for the call, to call, it, call for inputs um, it arose from uh, a request from the Secretary of State for the Competition and Markets Authorities to advise on how competition and consumer protection regimes can support the UK's net zero and sustainability goals. And they obviously have a section looking at competition enforcement. And again, one can see that they're looking at the key challenge, uh, I think, in their minds of how to identify and to measure sustainability benefits of agreements and initiatives and how to weigh them against uh, competition outcomes. It's interesting as well that the uh, call for inputs asks for any thoughts that any of this may have on private enforcement. So the CMA uh, 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 looking for a framework for value judgments and a way of manning, managing and assessing uh, the trade-offs that uh, arise, particularly when looking at exemptions. This slide also refers to the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and I just wanted to say in relation to that, under Title 11, um, there is there are a number of principles referring to uh, sustainable development. There's a mention uh, of the precautionary uh, approach for example, which uh, means that in potential threats of serious or irreversible, irreversible damage to the environment, the lack of scientific certainty sh should not be used as a reason for preventing a party adopting appropriate measures. And uh, in relation to uh, Article 7.4, parties uh, agreed to adopt the principle that environmental protection should be integrated into the making of policies. So again, that is uh, an important uh, stimulus to looking at all these issues and making sure that competition policy uh, reflects the direction of uh, ensuring sustainable practices. Uh, on to the next slide, please. In relation to abuse of dominance, uh, again, Simon has touched on this, but the danger is that products may be sold by dominant companies for less than the true cost of production, or that products used are sourced unsustainability, and that that has an effect on competitors as well as on uh, consumers. It's clearly something that the Commission is prepared to look into, and I've referenced here the PPC investigation, which commenced in March 2021. Uh, which looks at whether the, uh, amongst other things, whether the largest supplier of wholesale and retail electricity in Greece slowed down investment into greener uh, energy as part of its Article 102 investigation. Uh, I mentioned here whether or not there's, although slightly related to competition, but slightly outside the scope of uh, current enforcement, whether or not there's a role for fresh or new regulation of unfair trade practices in broader areas than, than are currently. Um, one of the areas in particular may be where there's significant either individual or joint buyer power and suppliers are dependent on those, those buyers when can think of purchases of, of foodstuffs or, or other commodities. Um, and, and really whether or not there's a, a case for looking at that, um, not only in a dominant sphere, but, but, but potentially um, certain ex ante regulation on that front. If I can turn to the last slide, please. The purpose of this slide is really to provide a, a reminder that similar sustainability questions arise in relation to other areas too. Obviously, there will be direct regulation on sustainability and low carbon issues, but there are certainly other areas, and I've mentioned here trade remedies and procurement. Who knows, but the effect of that broader uh, 
analysis, maybe a greater willingness to involve bodies and experts in designing and applying uh, new rules in future, and the acceptance that these questions have to be faced in all policy uh, and rule-based areas. On the trade remedy side, I think that probably environmental concerns are matters that the trade remedies authorities have to grapple with when looking at the economic interest test, um, both the uh, TRA and the Secretary of State, and no doubt also on the public interest test. On a broader level, questions of whether green subsidies are uh, compatible and therefore don't attract remedies because they comply with environmental goals may have to be addressed in future and policies uh, and, and rules uh, developed to deal with that. And the reverse situation, if countries don't have environmental standards or don't enforce them, so deforestation, for example, with the effect that goods are effectively subsidised, is that a subsidy that may be tar targeted uh, properly by trade remedies? Uh, wanted also to point to the fact that there's a separate uh, economic interest and public interest test in, in that sphere uh, over and above really whether or not the conditions in the other statutory tests are met and uh, uh, pose the question of whether that's a model that might be considered to uh, uh, undertake a, a wider form of balancing or a second stage of balancing also in competition law. And uh, lastly, procurement. Um, I think, again, there's much discussion about whether sustainability goals would be part of a compulsory uh, approach rather than a voluntary one. Uh, and again, it will be necessary to work out what that would mean and how the tools would be used in the future. So that really concludes my talk. And I was going to um, see if there are any questions. Um, and let me have a little look at the chat. In the meantime, um, Simon, I think one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was how and where do you see the system involving those with environmental policy uh, expertise in, in, in future? How do I, sorry, if I do that? How and where would you see um, any changes in the system which might involve environmental policy expertise in, in, in any sort of institutional or setting? Well, there's clearly um, an increasing overlap. I mean, historically, those involved in environmental law and those involved with competition law have been in completely different um, areas. But one thing I'm, I'm finding is that um, just as I am, as a competition lawyer, uh, increasingly interested in the environmental dimension, and as you see, trying to see how that can be factored into competition policy, I am finding that there's a growing interest amongst those um, involved with environmental issues, and the example that would obviously come to my mind would be Client Earth, um, which is uh, an organisation using the tool to using environment, using the law to fight environmental objectives, and they are increasingly attuned to the fact that um, competition policy is an important part of that, and indeed they do more work on the state aid side, which I touched on only very lightly. A lot of their work has been challenging. Um, state aid for unsustainable purposes or inappropriate um, approval um, by the Commission of things which are not really doing uh, the fight against climate change any good. So, uh, and so that, that's the overlap that I've observed. Yes, okay. I, uh, there's a couple of questions here, um, both from Sam Mobley at Baker McKenzie. The first yeah. was, uh, why is the Albany route uh, not your favourite path? forward. Uh, and the second was uh, a point about authorities needing to align because sustainability agreements are global and therefore there should be comfort from all the world's regulators. Okay, we're taking the first one. Sorry, it was a really lack. Of, it was only in the interest of time I skipped over the Albany route. But just for to say what that is, it's my shorthand for say, for, it's a reference to a judgment of the Court of Justice many years ago, where the Court of Justice decided that collective agreements um, fell outside competition law completely. And they did that, um, I think, to, 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 they could, on as a matter of law, have come to the opposite conclusion. But as a matter of policy, they didn't want uh, competition law and the courts to get involved with um, collective agreements, given the political sensitivities of it. So I mentioned it for two reasons in this context. One, it was essentially a policy decision, although not inconsistent with the law. It could have gone the other way, though. Um, and secondly, 
they relied upon the constitutional provisions as the legal basis for saying um, competition law didn't apply in that area. So it seemed to me that given that we're talking about something extremely important as a policy level, it would be open as a matter of law to come to the conclusion that um, agreements to fight climate change fall outside competition law. The reason I don't favour it is that um, I think it's, it's odd for me to say that. I think that's too radical. I don't think climate change agree things should fall outside competition law just because they deal with climate uh, change or just because they're good for the environment. Competition law still has to be applied. And what I've been looking at is the right balance and in integrating those concerns into competition law. Um, and turning to Sam's second question, um, that, that's to do with the need for international consistency. Well, yes, that's what everybody would like to achieve. But unfortunately, different people have different views on that. Um, even the Dutch um, were very careful to say that this is what we believe. But, and they're trying to get other people to come to their round to their point of view. At the moment, I think you've got um, the, the Greeks are clearly in agreement with them. The Belgians are, um, the Finns, probably the Austrians. But a lot of other countries will naturally side with the European Commission, which is taking a more, uh, uh, shall we say, conservative view. When the Commission publishes its guidelines um, shortly, um, it will be seen they'll be draft, and it'll be interesting to see how much scope there is for movement, because the Commission will be like to have consensus. Um, yeah, but it's a wider issue than Europe, and um, uh, it seems to me that the United States has hardly even started thinking about this yet. Countries like Australia, their public interest test is, is covers this. South Africa could cover this and their way of thinking. Um, but the United States, just one word on that, since it's so important in the global economy, it really hasn't got the first base on that, to use the US expression. But given, A, the more um, aggressive or more progressive approach to antitrust law under the Biden administration, with the appointment of people like James Cantor and Lena Khan, and the US now openly espousing the fight against climate change. In my view, it can only be a matter of time before that comes up the US antitrust agenda. Uh, one more from Aidan, um, which says, is there a problem with encouraging undertakings to put their head above the parapet and to engage positively with competition authorities in this area? There is. Yes, very much so. And as advisors, we all know how nervous um, companies are about putting their head above the parapet. It's what used to be called the Tesco problem in the UK. Nobody was going to make a complaint against Tesco, however much they complained about them, because they were the um, their biggest customer. And yes, it, 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 it's the source of frustration. If you talk to the Dutch Competition Authority, they're calling upon people to come forward with examples. But when you actually talk to business, and, but they've had relatively few. And when you talk to business, the last thing they want to do is to um, um, put their head above the parapet. As one general counsel, Compet general competition counsel said to me the other day, um, we're confident that this isn't problematic. But we're going to have to take a view because if we go to the European Commission, we're concerned about two things. One much as they say to the contrary, they'll take forever to look at it and ask us a thousand questions. And secondly, you don't know what else they're going to start delving into out of curiosity. So it is a big problem. How might that be overcome? Is there, or, or, or is it really a question of um, having worked examples or guidance like, like, like guidelines actually taking scenarios through? I think it's a, it's a mixture of a number of things. One, there will be one or two companies coming through, and those examples need to be made more public. Uh, um, and I'll give you an example of that, something um, which I mentioned on my slide but didn't speak to, and that was the, um, the fair trade, the, the, um, which illustrates the problem. There was the, um, uh, sorry, what do you call it, the Fair Wage Foundation uh, opinion on a living wage. That was an agreement amongst textile garment manufacturers to pay a living wage to textile workers who were paid you know, sub subsistence wages. And uh, there was a legal opinion given by an eminent law firm. And that said, look, this is not the sort of thing the commission, the authorities would look at. And if they did, we don't think it's caught. Now, what it, the published opinion doesn't say is that the European Commission was actually consulted on that behind the scenes, but they wouldn't say anything publicly. Now I think that's so. That's a big change. Now the authorities will. will I think now I think the Commission would say something publicly on that. So whenever they have the opportunity, the authorities ought to, be, I mind, be subject to um, client confidentiality, business confidentiality, publishing a, a very short um, press release or letter 
bit like the business review letters in the in the United States. Uh, and um, and even where that isn't possible, I think the authorities need to have the um, confidence to give a view. They can put in the easily words of qualifying it, but they need to be prepared to give a view without asking a thousand questions and taking six months to do it. Thank you. OK, I think we've probably reached the end of our hour, but it just remains for me to thank you very much, Simon, for talking on this subject today. And thank you, too, for the questions that we received. And uh, th thanks very much. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more on the topic um, as the months progress. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.